pushing our clients really hard to go what we call fully modern and cloud native. And that means um, going passwordless. So back in the day when we had lots of passwords and we had a notebook or an app for them or a spreadsheet, whatever, you know, that's a nightmare now. Uh, if you think about what's happening from a security perspective, we've got something like 30 billion password attacks happening per month at the moment, 30 billion. Welcome to the Business Ownership Podcast, brought to you by Awareness Strategies, helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Dennis. Dennis, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Michelle. I'm excited to be on your show. Awesome. So give us a highlight of who you are and what you do for business. Sure. Dennis O'Shea is my name. I'm an Irish New Zealander who lives in America, and I run an IT services company that is rather unique and special in the way we work with primarily with organizations that have a remote workforce or a modern hybrid workforce. <laughs> we are going to have a ton of fun because one, I love your accent. And two, I love talking technology and business. So this is going to go oh, cool. great. <laughs> I've been so, working on this accent for over 50 years. I've got I mean, it you know, every day, all day, every day. Got to <laughs> dial in. All right. So let's back up the bus on the business side. How did you get into technology as you think? How did I get into it? Oh my God. Yeah. Um, I got into it just through university and an interest in technology. And I did the usual stuff, did a degree in technology, did a master's in technology, worked in it for a while and then realized I didn't like it very much. Or sorry, that I wasn't very good at it. I oh. wasn't a great engineer. So I started to never get my way out of working with the technology. Fair enough. Mm. <laughs> what happened? How did that transpire? How did you start? In your own company? Oh, that was a bit of a journey. I used to work for Nokia. Remember the company yeah. that made smartphones yeah. for us once upon a time? I, do. I used to work for them in Finland. I was an engineer in the lab. That was fun for a while. And then they asked me to go to New Zealand to help set up the world's first cellular network back in the early 90s. And I was like, sure, just give me tickets and I'm, I'm out of here. And I went to New Zealand on a nine-month contract, fell in love with the country, stayed there for 25 years and kind of slowly got out of the technology. And along the way, I could see some challenges in the industry. I could see, and actually I moved from New Zealand to Switzerland for a while. My kids were born there. And, and along the way, I could see there were some interesting things happening. The technology was charging ahead. There was so much innovation happening with cellular technology. But as humans, we were kind of lagging behind and what I noticed around the early 2000s was billions were being spent on these cellular networks, 3G networks. And people were often spending $1,000 on this thing called a smartphone. But you know what they were doing with them? They were making phone calls and sending text messages. That was it. <laughs> and it was this amazing technology that really wasn't being utilized. And so I decided to do something about that. So I left my career at Nokia, which was, was great. I'd been there 15 years. And I decided to set up a business to see if I could drive better adoption of smartphones in a way that would benefit business people. So I think like entrepreneurs or people running small businesses that are running around and insanely busy. And I thought, how could we make them more productive if they could really set up a smartphone to do all the things it was designed for, not just making phone calls and sending text messages. And so I set up the business called Mobile Mentor that will we'll, we'll mentor one person at a time and we'll essentially get them set up and get everything working. And I don't know if you can remember, but back in 2004, it was so difficult to get a smartphone set up and working. Like trying to get your right. email working, that was hard. Trying to transfer your contacts was hard. Trying to sync your calendar. That was all just, it was all really painfully difficult. But we figured out how to do it in about an hour for somebody. Wow. And so our business model was very simple. We said, we'll sit down with somebody for one hour. We'll get that person up and running, really productive with their smartphone. And we'll do that over and over. And we eventually did that for a million people. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. I can't believe there was that many people that were that frustrated. <laughs> yep. Just here, take this. Look, take a word. There were. Back in those days, there were, <laughs> you know, probably a billion people frustrated because they had spent a thousand dollars on a smartphone that they couldn't really use for much. Use. Um, and we ran that business model for a few years until the global financial crisis and mm -hmm. things suddenly changed and the business model came crashing down, which was, which was a really interesting phase of life, as you can imagine, as an entrepreneur. 
So right. I had I had 250 staff in uh, China and Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, some parts of Europe, and um, suddenly with the with the global financial crisis, the business model looked really really weak. And around the same time, the iPhone came out, and that was super easy to set up compared to previous devices like Nokia and Motorola and BlackBerry. The the iPhone was super easy to set up, so our business model suddenly started to look very flaky, and. Um, I had some tough choices and I, I essentially had to navigate our way from having 250 employees down to 15, one five and completely pivot the business model and take everything we had learned about people and how they use technology and the triggers and barriers to adopting technology. We learned a lot, you know, when you sit in front of a million people as an organization, we learned a lot about technology adoption. So we took those skills and we kind of pivoted to become an IT services company with a really strong focus on the end user experience. And, and help well, if people all else it. fails, just saying you have a huge career in being able to help people transition through that time, because God knows that is not a fun time, but to know that you've navigated it and, and come out swinging is fantastic to hear. I mean, Thank that just you. makes me purr because it's, to me, that's the epitome of, entrepreneurship is being able to hit those highs and then being able to come back, draw back and, and knock it out of the park again. I think that's yeah. awesome. Congratulations. And you didn't mention the lows, but there might've been one or two. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's in those lows that we need to know that there's hope and that somebody else has done it and that if they can do it, we can do it. And it's all good. Yeah. Nice. And the sun rises another day. Exactly. So talk to me now about the, the, the tech you're helping businesses with technology and getting it into their companies kind of to what extent and how do you do that? Okay. Everything we do today is mm -hmm. wrapped around Microsoft 365, mm -hmm. which is the technology tool set most people use for their productivity and security and collaboration and all of that. So, you know, typically today our clients are small businesses, small to medium sized businesses, some large, and they're trying to be secure because we're all trying to avoid getting hacked and ransomed and scammed and fleeced and all of that. So we're trying to be more secure and using all the technology to the max from a security perspective, but also helping our clients be as productive as they possibly can be in the way they work with all the Microsoft applications on all their devices. Because if you think about today's reality, right, we're using some personal devices and we might have some company devices and we're signing into all our things all over the place. And we're working all over the place. Some days we're at home. Some days we're at an airport. Some days we're in an office. Some days we're on the client site, wherever. So we've got this really fluid um, workplace nowadays where you could be working on any device anywhere. And we've got to be secure and we've got to be productive. So the challenge Until is the is, Microsoft gods and Google gods stop us and go, oh, we need double authentication as your plane flies. Over here. Yes, there you go. And that's just <laughs> one of many, many layers that that are hopefully right. in play to protect you. <clears throat> so yes. when you get that dodgy email and you think it's okay to click on it or, you know, hopefully you are being protected by some of this technology. Well, our timing is epic because I happen to be going through the whole multiple account thing <laughs> with multiple businesses trying to get in and on and get everybody working going who are you what are you working on <laughs> so this go. is going to be super fun go. okay yeah. so talk to me about microsoft 360 for those of us who are the listeners that may not be familiar with it just give me kind of the five thousand foot view of what it is and how it works just in case somebody's not familiar with it so everybody probably knows Word and Excel and PowerPoint and some of those tools. That's kind of where it started. Now it is Microsoft 365 is all those traditional office applications that we use for words and documents and spreadsheets and all that. Um, all of those plus email, plus Teams for collaboration, you know, an alternative to Zoom, plus a whole swag of security products. Like I'm talking, there's so many, it's unbelievable. Um, and as a company, we can only pick a small number of them. And we're trying to be the best in the world at one of those in particular, which is called Intune, I-N-T-U-N-E. And it's the tool we use to set up people's devices and manage the devices, secure them, secure the data. That's just one of many tools in the in the you know technology stack. Um, and, and essentially, 
Microsoft 365 is the combination of those productivity tools, Excel and Word and Outlook and Teams, plus the uh, Windows software that might run on your desktop or laptop computer, plus all the security products and the identity products. So if you've got a company with a bunch of people, you've hopefully got them all set up with accounts in the company. So when they join the organization, you can say, okay, Jane.do at the company is now set up as a user. So now Jane.do can access all our applications. And then the day Jane leaves at five o'clock on that Friday, we can say, we're removing Jane and Jane is removed from all our applications and can't access our data anymore. So good onboarding, good offboarding and preventing data leakage, you know, losing client data, losing confidential stuff because we're putting good bookends at either end of the employment engagement and using the technology, you know, as it was intended. Yeah. And anybody that has ever gone through that with anybody that was leaving on a bitter note <laughs> appreciates the the security of that system. There you go. And, and it's not just removing access to their data, but any data that sits on their devices, you know, they might be getting company email on their personal smartphone. They might have access to Teams chats that have a whole bunch of information. They might have some OneDrive stuff synced onto a personal laptop. We've got to be able to reach in and nuke all of that data at five o'clock on Friday. Right. Or maybe That's it's only 9 a.m. on Monday morning and you're having a, a separation <laughs> conversation with somebody and you know, you know that this is going to go nuclear. I need to, I need to remove all company data pronto from their devices do now, that does that mean they box. still have access to all that data on their own device nope nope no nope. i mean like the company oh yes the company the, so the, the company, company still access the still has access to all that information. correct but it would just mean that jane that's, um, not. It, it, that's the term the, the employee who's leaving would no yep. longer be able to access it and everything right. would just disappear from her phone and laptop and all so that. funny 2000 story for you. So once upon a time, I worked at a company and I was their project manager, coordinator, and their IT person. And I had way too many hats on and they knew it. So they hired an IT person and they fired me. And I went, well, that was stupid, but okay. <laughs> so they're like, oh, do you know anything about these sites? And I'm like, yeah, I know everything about those sites. I said, I don't suppose you blew up my email for safety reasons. Did you? Oh yes, absolutely. We did. Okay, good. Um, you can contract me because <laughs> I knew everything and they knew because what they had done is they deleted my accounts. They didn't unsecure my account or my, and like change the security on my accounts. They just blew them up. And I'm like, that is really bad business practice, but okay. Burnt their bridges. <laughs> All right. So this um, to me is brilliant because so many companies have so much data and they don't know, you know, any person can have five devices quite easily and normally. You know, oh, yeah. I have my desktop at home. I have my desktop at work. I have my phone. I have my laptop. I have my iPad. Oh, my a tablet. Yeah. Right. There you go. Like that's just almost normal now. It is. And and like I mentioned before, some of those devices might be owned by the company. Some might be personal. You're probably accessing some company information on all devices. And IT mm -hmm. people hate to hear this, but there is leakage going on. You know, we're, we're living in this world where we're kind of, it, it's hybrid and we've got hybrid um, you know, if you look at someone's desk, there's all these devices mashed up and data is moving around and it's all a horrible mashup today. So that's the reality. And we're signing in with different passwords, but sometimes we're sharing passwords and, and it's, uh, it's a mess <laughs> quite nicely. Right? It's a mess. <laughs> so Intune, what does it do in particular that you like and why is it your, your security software of choice? Oh, look, it, 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 it's a great product nowadays. It was a dog of a product about seven years ago when we started working with it. But now what it does is it streamlines the whole setup process. So let's say you got a new employee starting at nine on Monday. Um, you can use this Intune product to set up their computer from scratch without touching it. It's called zero touch um, provisioning. So traditionally, you would need an IT person to take it out of the box and muck around with it for about two hours and get everything set up and then go and sit down with the user and change a password and do all that nonsense. So now we can just ship it directly to the end user's home. It doesn't, it goes straight from the factory to the end user's home. Doesn't need to come to the company first. Doesn't need to be taken out of the box by an IT person. Doesn't need double shipping. I know it's so good. 
And so we can do that now. And the end user signs in and all their folders and files come down and all their applications and all their things and all their security and it takes about 12 minutes, but they now have a fully configured machine good to go. And then the same thing happens for their tablet or their smartphone or their desktop, whatever, MacBook. Um, and that's just the beginning. That's and just the, the angels beginning came down the and sang. <laughs> What's even, that? I said, and then the angels came down and sang because <laughs> even just, just changing my phone. So I had a Samsung, I changed it to a Samsung, but I have a different provider and it's so much easier than it was before, but it's still chaos and mayhem because my <laughs> old phone had, um, I think the video card went or something like that. Okay. And so it changed some of the applications and so the new phone took on those new changes. <laughs> no, you can't blow up on me now. No, yeah, you yeah. that's a terrible yeah. idea. So with yours, I could have just had like the system set up without <laughs> viruses yeah. and or breakups and then just download it onto my new phone and bam, 20 minutes later, whatever it was, would have been. Yeah. And if it's, if it's actually a personal phone, you probably don't want your company managing it and taking well, full company, control so. of it. <laughs> What's that? So it's my company. So. As your company. Life, okay. I can download my phone. But if you happen to be an employee of somebody else's company, you might have an opinion about them managing your personal phone. I would expect you to have an opinion about that. And and so one of the cool things about this Microsoft Intune product is, is um IT managers no longer need to manage that phone, but they can wrap like a secure bubble around the company data that would be access on the phone. So you could get company email, you could have Teams chats, you can have stuff like that with some security around it, but the phone can be unmanaged. So that's a really neat solution. Right? That is brilliant. You can set that up in a couple of minutes. Right. So when it comes to the size of a company, because um, once upon a time we had our our teams, and we, <laughs> we grow, we shrink, we do the things that normal small business does. Um, what size of company would you typically be working with? Because I know once upon a time, Microsoft products were for the big boys. Like you had Salesforce, you had Microsoft product, and you had the thing. And the rest of us just had kind of Word and <laughs> Excel and <laughs> yeah, yeah. on our machines. Um, but now I think everybody has Microsoft 365, do they not? Pretty much, pretty much everybody, or, or at least some parts of the Microsoft um, stack. Um, so most of our clients would have tens of end users up to hundreds of end users. Most we've got many, of course, that are in the thousands as well, but the, the SMB market that we serve typically, um, maybe 50 plus employees, which probably means a couple of two, 300 devices uh, across the organization. And most people nowadays have this hybrid thing going on. They might have a small office. They might go in there now and again, but of course they got a lot of employees who are remote they, you know we're able to hire talent wherever the talent lives and so you know it's very common nowadays to have this hybrid configuration people all over the place with a wide range of devices um, needing to be productive anywhere and needing to be set up but still secure that's a very typical client profile in 2024 very typical and i think that kind of describes everybody in that process or in that level of business so Assuming that, that somebody's listening to this, I'm going to assume that they don't have somebody like you working with them, that it's just kind of everybody's doing their own thing and we don't really know what's going on anywhere. Am I right? That's kind of your typical client that comes to see you? Yes. Some will have nobody. Some will have a traditional IT company, you know, an IT contractor who comes in and does things or does that process of taking the machine out of the box and setting it up for two hours and put it back in the box and blah, blah, blah. Um we take a slightly different approach and that we're using this Microsoft technology. We're modernizing the way we do things. Um, we're getting rid of passwords. That's the other cool thing. So we're, we're pushing our clients really hard to go what we call fully modern and cloud native. And that means um, going passwordless. So back in the day when we had lots of passwords and we had a notebook or an app for them or a spreadsheet, whatever, you know, that's a nightmare now. Uh, if you think about what's happening from a security perspective, we got something like 30 billion password attacks happening per month at the moment, 30 billion. And, you know, passwords were a great invention back in 1961 when they were invented. Now in 24, they're a freaking disaster. Right. They're the number one reason for compromises and all the hacks and breaches we read about. 
it all started with somebody typing their password into the wrong web page. Right. That's where the majority of them start. So we're, we, you know, we're, we're pushing one, two, three, our clients four. pretty hard to go. What's that? I said password one, two, three, four. No, there you I don't go. know. You remember back in the 2000s, that was everybody's password. <laughs> it's password one, two, three, four. It was. And if you were an IT administrator, <laughs> your, your yeah. admin username was admin. And the password was admin. And that got you into all the servers and all the right. systems and tools. And we wonder why it doesn't work. <laughs> and we wonder why people get hacked. Right. <laughs> but no, it, it's okay. um, it's wonderful what we can do now that we can go so, fully passwordless, like on Windows, on Macs, on iPhones, iPads, wow. Androids. Um, wow. it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing. Oh, I know. How does that work? How, do, How does it I work? can't even fathom what it would take to be able to control that much software and not have passwords. It's actually simpler than people realize. So you've got an Android, not a smartphone, not a, not an iPhone, I mean. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm Mac or um, Microsoft all the way, not Mac. Okay. So I have, I live with an IT guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so on your Android, are you using your 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 thumbprint or is it face or how do you get? How oh do you hell get no, no I'm. Well, I I did a little squiggle. A squiggle. Okay, yeah. well that's better than a password. I'm I'm on an iPhone and I just pick it up and it scans my face, and You're brave, and it, <laughs> immediately it looks at three hundred thousand data points and it says, okay, this is Dennis O'Shea. We'll we'll allow him in. And, and and it even does that if I'm wearing a, a mask, like during COVID, that worked. If I'm wearing sunglasses, if I'm outside in glary light, it still works. It's quite amazing. So that was a passwordless sign-in to the operating system. That got me as far as the iOS operating system. Then if you've got applications that have single sign-on, so they're trusted applications, and they allow you to use the same credentials to go from the operating system into the application, now I can get into that application. But if I want to do a more secure app, say my banking app, that's going to do a two-factor thing, right? It's going to ask me for another factor, type in a PIN code, whatever. Um, so now we got three layers. We had the biometrics to sign into the onto the device, single sign onto an application with bio, with um, multi-factor verification. And then there's some rules in the background that join these together. And that works beautifully on smartphones today, has done so for years. And for about the last three years, that works on Windows machines. So if you've got a Windows computer, there's something called uh, Windows Hello. And it, as I said, you open the machine, scans your face, it signs you in. It takes about 4.6 seconds for me to open a cold my cold laptop to be signed in and able to wiggle the mouse or start to type an email. 4.6 seconds. It is so good. It's so good. And so it just gets us away from typing passwords and managing passwords. And, you know, for, for most of us, we will keep one password for a while, but hopefully it's a really long passphrase, you know, a whole sentence, and it never changes and it's super secure. But other than that, we just use our faces and we get signed into everything automatically and we can't be fished or hacked because we're not in the habit of typing passwords. So very hard to fool us to then type our work password into someone's dodgy web page. Right. <laughs> wow. So, what are the what are the odds of not being able to use this software on a web browser? So, of course, my brain goes to hackers will always figure out a way to hack something. They so, will. if somebody is silly enough to still go into their, I don't know, whatever, click on an email and go into some software and happen to still have their camera turned on and go okay or like can can they hack that system or is it just so expensive and so arduous right now to be able to take an actual um scan of somebody's face because you can't do it on a picture right so for everybody freaking out right now going oh can't they just take it off picture you can't take it off picture because you need Correct. You can't take it off a picture because your face is 3D and then right. and, and, and there's a lot more data points. But also, um, the way the, the the way the biometric authentication works on the computer is the biometric profile for the user is stored on that machine and it's encrypted. It's not saved up to the cloud somewhere it could potentially be hacked. It only stays on your machine, 
And if your machine ever gets compromised, that gets the first thing to get deleted and it's encrypted. Right. So it's it's local and it's, it's, it's unique to you only. Right. That makes nice. sense? Yes, it does. Very cool. So when somebody is working with you, what is the process that they would undergo to go, hey, Dennis, we're thinking about doing this. Like, do you go in and look at kind of how many devices they have? Do you look at what kind of security they have? What's kind of the priority for you up front? That's the, that's the fun part for me. So, <laughs> honestly, that's the fun. As a founder, that's the part I get the greatest kick out of is we've got a really good um, assessment methodology. So like I've done a uh, hundred of these in the last year. So we'll, we'll go into a company. There's a whole series of questions we need to ask to understand what's their current setup and how secure are they or are they not? And what's their employee experience like? And how do they onboard their employees? How do they equip people to be productive? Uh, there's a whole bunch of questions. We then um, score them, compare them to others, which is always fun. Um, but most importantly, we think can map out logically what does a, what does a good roadmap look like so based on a really good honest understanding of today's starting point and very often you know clients approach us because they've bought microsoft licenses they're spending the money but they're not getting the value and so we're helping them unpack all the capability they've bought from microsoft and helping them figure out how we're going to turn it on how we're going to make you more secure give your employees a better experience enable you to collaborate and do all the things and now of course ai you know, people want to use AI, but they also don't want to give away all the company information to check GPT. So as people want to use like Microsoft Copilot and do that securely, so you could actually take all the information in a Word document and get it rewritten or all your data in a spreadsheet and get it analyzed and charted and graphed and all that. You want to be able to do that and use AI, but you don't want to just put it out there into check GPT because now it's gone. And it's part of someone else's large language model and and bye-bye proprietary company data. <laughs> it's going to show up in someone else's search when they go looking for information on your industry. Um, right. So what we're really trying to do, I guess, is do the assessment, understand where the starting point is, a really good, honest assessment, then build out a roadmap to say, here's how we're going to get you more secure, enable productivity to happen the way it should happen, and collaboration, and then responsible use of AI so you can be work smarter and better and faster and cheaper and all that, but doing so in a way that you're not pasting your company data into chat GPT all day, every day, uh, which is what is happening. We know 78% of end users are using, um, you know, open source uh, AI tools, Google Gemini and chat GPT and all that. So company data is being pasted into those tools all day, every day. That ain't good. If you're building a business that has some IP, and something you want to protect. So and if that terrifies you, hang on. Because <laughs> we got more to come. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you about a Cinderella story of one of your clients. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break. Are you running a business over seven figures, but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention. You do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap. They offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this. Do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap. So I'm super excited to hear about a Cinderella story of one of your clients. Oh, I got a great one. Um, there's a, a really neat organization in Nashville, Tennessee called Alive Hospice. So they're a, they're a classic hospice organization taking care for people in the last stage of life. And they're quite technologically advanced. They actually give an iPad to every patient that's going through their care service, right? And it's typically seven or eight weeks that people are, are in hospice care before end of life. And Alive gives them um, this iPad to do daily check-ins and they can have sessions with a, a chaplain or a counselor. They can ask for more medication people checking in with them. It's a really great thing. And um, they have that now. But when COVID happened, uh, just before COVID, they used to have a chaplain visit, I think, every day, and a nurse and a care worker and all this, come and visit them in their home. When COVID happened, suddenly the, all those care visits stopped and all these people were suddenly isolated. So in addition to having cancer or whatever they've got, now they've got nobody visiting them 
and they're cut off. And we were able to use that Microsoft technology we talked about before, Microsoft Intune, to quickly set up hundreds of iPads and equip them to ship an iPad out to all of those patients so they could have this engagement every day digitally and talk to the chaplain, the nurse, the care worker, the pharmacist, whatever, um, and, and make sure they were not isolated through this scary time. And, but it also kept all the caregivers safe because they weren't going into people's homes. They weren't getting COVID and they weren't passing it on. They weren't bringing it home to their families. So pretty sure we saved quite a lot of lives because if you look at the stats from some of the rest homes in New York, they were just horrific, the death tolls. Um, we had extremely low death tolls in, in, in Nashville at that time. And I attribute a large part of it to that Microsoft technology and how it enabled people to work differently very quickly in a, in a trying time. Nice. That is awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Cause that just makes me sad when people get isolated, when they need people the most. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when it comes to you, other than clearly being heartfelt, <laughs> what could you say <laughs> your, your superpower is as a company? Oh, our superpower. So we've been in this business for 19 and a half years. We'll celebrate 20 this year. And we've got a simple mission. We want to be the best in the world at one thing. So we're not trying to be all things in IT because IT is huge. We're trying to be the best in the world at one thing, which is how we set up and manage people's endpoints or their devices. So device management, that's our, that's our field. And um, something I'm hugely proud of is we won Microsoft's Global Award for Partner of the Year in 2021. We've been a finalist every year since then. So we're recognized globally now for what we do in that in that space. And and Microsoft is an amazing, you know, partner to us. They bring us leads every day. Say, this company over here needs to talk to you. You need to talk to this company. You need to go in here, this school, this hospital, this government department, this, you know, municipality. Um, so that's really our superpower is being the best in the world at that one thing and having the balls to say no to everything else. You know, we get a lot of requests. Can you set up our telephony system? Sorry, no. Can you set up our servers? Sorry, no. Can you migrate our data center? Sorry, no. You know, saying no to everything except, you know, setting up the devices and keeping them secure and enabling people to be productive on them. That's our lane and, and sticking to that. I think that's our superpower. Good for you. Because I know as an entrepreneur, that's super hard to do, especially when you got clients knocking on the door, but I need you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I know our peeps are going to want more from you too. So how did they start that journey with you? They can contact me on LinkedIn, Dennis O'Shea, Dennis with one N. My parents took the lazy uh, option. So <laughs> D-E-N-I-S and O-S-H-E-A. Uh, or my company name is Mobile Mentor. So we're mobile-mentor.com. And we operate in the US and Australia and New Zealand. So when you're working with us, you might hear some nice accents. Um. And you can contact us and ask for Dennis, and I'd be more than happy to do a free assessment for any one of your clients, Michelle. So nice. that assessment process, it's an investment of our time, but we get to know a lot about the client's environment, and then we build out a roadmap and we show them some good value through that alone. Um, we're happy to do that, no cost for any of your clients. So nice. I just send them our way. Excellent. So peeps, we will, of course, have all of Dennis's links in the show notes. Go ahead and click on the links, open them up in a new browser because we're not done yet. So Dennis, I get to ask you, at what point in life did you know you were a special kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> I'm a what? <laughs> I run a company? I have to make decisions? I, I don't know about that. Somebody said to me a long time ago, you don't, you don't go into business, you grow into business. <laughs> And right. every day I tell my kids, we're a learning species. Every day we try and do things a little bit better and make improvements on what we did yesterday. And it's a constant journey. So I don't feel like we have achieved success yet. Um, others may, may say we have, but for me, it's a journey and it never ends. So it's I an love infinite it. journey. You've been absolutely awesome. Any last words for our peeps? Oh, I just want to say to your, your 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 peeps keep on keep on doing your thing and uh try and be the best in the world at one thing that's my advice that i tell everybody try and be the best in the world at one thing be known for something stand out dennis you've been absolutely fantastic thank you for your time i appreciate it and i know how valuable it is thank you michelle it's been a pleasure
Awesome. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedelec. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. Are you running a business over seven figures but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention. You do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap. They offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this. Do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap.